Well, I'm humbled to be here. Uh, thank you all for taking some time out of your busy schedules. I know everyone's busy. Uh, to spend some time with me to talk about sales process. So I like to start with defining what sales process means to me. I'm, I'm going to talk a lot about the ways I look at business and the ways that I focus on creating a methodology uh, for success. I'm no means saying this is the only way to do things. Uh, you can uh, sell. There's a lot of successful people out there that sell without uh, a process that's probably as defined as the one I'm going to be talking about. What, I'm, what I've seen as I've progressed through my sales career, and I've, I've done inside sales, I've managed inside sales teams, I've done uh, local regional selling, I've done domestic, uh, like uh, US-based sales, I've done global sales. And what I've found over the years is the more defined your process gets and the more you can identify gaps within your process, the better you'll get, the more deals you'll close, and the bigger those deals will be. So in order for me to really think about how to judge myself, how to measure myself, how to identify gaps within my own process, I've needed to kind of build out this way of approaching my opportunities. And that's what I look at as the definition of a sales process. It is a methodical way that you approach an opportunity every single time to increase your likelihood of closing the deal. I want to be clear. You can do everything right and still lose. I lose all the time. And I, and I like to think I do things the, I like to think I follow the process and do things right. But at the end of the day, it's about increasing the probability of closing the sale. So when I start talking about all these things, don't think I'm saying you're doing things wrong. Don't think I'm saying this is the only way to do them. Think of it as the more you can adapt here, the uh, higher likelihood of closing the opportunities that you're in. So what I'll be talking about is first time in territory management. I had a lot of failure very early on in my career with this. I was all over the place. Uh, so I had to learn in order to be able to manage a process, have time to prospect, have time to do all the things that we do in sales. I needed to first be able to manage the territory I was in. Uh, the next is list identification. I'm going to spend a little bit of time here because I honestly believe that your best years in sales can be your first one to two years. I'm going to get into how to then gain access and opportunities. And then I'm going to get into pipeline management in the stages of a deal. So this is Austin, for anyone who doesn't know that. Uh, when I first started in sales, I was uh, with a company called, um, actually, I'm not, this is going to be all over the place, so I'm not going to even mention the company. But I was with an organization who uh, forced uh, their sales reps to be in their office uh, Mondays and Fridays. For me, uh, I lived in upstate New York. And their office was in Ramsey, New Jersey. I don't know if anyone knows kind of from a map perspective where those things are. Um, they're about 400 miles apart. And then I also covered the entire uh, state of New York at that time. So they didn't teach time and territory management. And I got burnt out uh, within the first four months. I was living uh, in planes, airports, cars. I would have appointments in one part of New York and drive 300 miles to another part of New York. And you know, I was just trying to meet with people and meet with as many people as I could. And I learned very early on that uh, that was a recipe for failure because I couldn't really do uh, anything else. I was just windshield time, flight time. Uh, so I decided my next move should be with an organization who really does teach sales process. So I joined um, a company called Aramark, still one of my uh, best experiences. Uh, we shrunk my territory from the state of New York and being in New Jersey to uh, Rochester. So anybody here have kind of a single market that they cover, just like uh, a city? OK. Who here covers uh, regionally? OK. Anybody nationally? Anybody globally? OK. One person. Cool. So when I was doing uh, single city sales, I had a grid very similar to this one, where I blocked out uh, one uh, day per week uh, and spent my time there. And I had a little, uh, it was a map uh, in my office that had the city broken down by zip code and a little square here. So when I was prospecting, I knew Mondays I'd be here, Tuesdays I'd be here, Wednesdays here, Thursdays here, Fridays here. Uh, so when I was cold calling, I would call and say I'm going to be in the area at this time and so on and so forth. Uh, that made sure that I was super focused, could spend a lot of time in the different markets or in the different areas of my territory. When I got uh, more regional and global sales, uh, what became really, really important is when to say no. So if I'm going to leave you with one thing on time and territory management, know when to say no. There's a lot of people I work with who will travel for first time meetings. Uh, how many people have ever been in flight to a client that canceled on you? Yeah. Awesome. How many people have ever uh, showed up to a meeting and who you thought you were meeting with? Uh, not that person. 
Yeah. Uh, how many people showed up to a meeting and realized that they were trying to buy something that you couldn't sell them? Okay. So this is, I mean, it, it's funny, but hey, I, I've been there. I've literally done all of those things, um, and I've done them a lot. Uh, and what I learned is I need to not do those things because I think we all know that you get on a plane, you leave your families, uh, you leave uh, your prospecting, you leave you know, lots of things behind both personally and professionally when you travel. Uh, you can, on average, lose one to two days of your life uh, and if you lose that for the wrong reasons and you do that enough, you're not going to have time to do all the right things. So time and territory management to me became really, really, really important. So I want to leave you guys with that. So I've made a comment early. Uh, your first year in sales can be your best year. Uh, I believe it's your first one to two years. Um, I've been, and this is not a, a brag on myself, this is just a you know, fact of my life, I've been promoted uh, every single year that I've been in sales. Uh, the way I've done that is by making sure that uh, my uh, best years are often my first years, and it's by making sure that the, and if you, uh, if you think about your book of business, most books of business are designed to hold a territory for three, four, five years. If you're, uh, the best accounts in those territories can often be uh, the top maybe 10%. The trick here is how do you identify what your best opportunities are early on? So that to me is list identification. So anytime I get a brand new territory, the first thing I'm doing is creating like an Excel spreadsheet and I'm looking at the company size, the best fit industries, referenceable clients, like-minded clients that we have uh, case studies for, uh, things like that. And I'm taking that list and I'm immediately sorting it and I'm identifying, it, say it's 1,000 accounts, say it's 100 accounts, that top 10%, those 10 or 100 opportunities that I need to be spending the most amount of my time with. From there, I'm trying to figure out who I should be speaking with. I'm going to be talking a little bit today about economic buyers. Uh, can anyone shout out what an economic buyer is in the room? Person who writes a check. Person who writes a check. Decision maker. Person who has discretionary funds that can create budget or use budget. Uh, those, to me, are your ultimate decision makers. I'm not saying you can't sell to other people. You absolutely can, and it's important to, as Dewan said, spend as much time with people to learn information. But at the end of the day, there's going to be an individual that signs a check. <coughs> So it's how do you find that person and spend as much time as you can early on in the sales process with that person and keep them engaged throughout that sales process. So to me, that's looking at their company website, uh, looking at their leadership team, people that are mentioned on their company website, going to LinkedIn, looking for people with titles of uh, VP and above, going to news articles. So now you have this list of your best companies and your best targets. So now it's how do I align the issues that I know that they're going to have so when I'm doing my reach out to them, I can be highly relevant for them. So that's natural industry issues. Those are annual reports. Um, those are kind of changes that are going on in market conditions, things like that. I'm looking for those high-level pain points. So as you're building kind of your Excel spreadsheet early on, you've got your people, you've got your companies that you're going to be targeting, spending the most time with early on. You've got your people, and you've got the high-level pain that each of those companies that you're going to be targeting has. So from there, it's gaining access. Love that picture. <laughs> Wanted aggressive salesman. Uh, so there's lots of ways to gain access, uh, tons. Uh, we could literally spend the rest of this time on all the different methodologies that have been created to uh, find and have appointments with people. I'm going to talk about the two that I use most often that I see being the most successful. One of them is highly persistent. The other is highly creative. So you now have your, this list of the people you want to talk to. And when I'm messaging folks, has anyone ever heard of the SAR format? Raise your hand if you have. Okay. So SAR stands for six, Situation, Action, Result. Here is the business challenge that people are faced with. Here's the action they took, in theory, with my solution. And here's the results, the business impact that they got from it. If every single email that you send is that simple, here's the situation, here's the action, here's the result, you will get more meetings. Because at the end of the day, that's what people care about. They care about, do you know the problems that I'm faced with? What actions can I take with you to help solve those problems? And what business impact, what results am I going to get? If you have SAR in all of your emails, you'll get more meetings. So eight touch campaigns. Um, I've been doing these for three, four years now. Hit rate on them anywhere from 10 to 20% acceptance. Uh, these are, I start with a handwritten note using a SAR format. Here are the industry challenges I know you're faced with. Here's the actions you took. Here are the results you got. Uh, I then follow up with eight touches. It can, it can be a lot. It can seem uh, overwhelming. But it's what people need to have these days to cut through all the clutter. And these are touches like emails, 
uh, phone calls, uh, LinkedIn notes. Be as you know, um, multi-channel as you possibly can, because at the end of the day, some people may not be checking email, some people may not be checking their LinkedIn. You gotta hit them in, in a lot of different ways. One of the last things I do on my eight touch campaigns is I schedule, I send them a, a calendar invite with a, hey, uh, this is the things I've been reaching out to you about. Here are the, again, challenges, here are the results. I'd like to schedule 30 minutes with you. Uh, those blind emails, uh, the, or those blind Outlook invites, super successful. Don't recommend that as your first touch. That can be intrusive. But by your eight touch, they, people know why you're now reaching out. You're referencing it. Super successful. The next one, uh, I just started doing this probably about six months ago. Uh, we call them at ADP, we call them college drops. Uh, but it's uh, go to your client's LinkedIn profile. Look at what school they went to. Go to the alumni center of that school, uh, not physically, you know, you do it online, uh, and you get a t-shirt, a coffee mug, a Yeti, a sweatshirt, what have you, with the school they went on, uh, with the school they went to. Send it to them. Little package, some note around it, love to meet with you, yada, yada. Those get phenomenal results. I've got like a 90% reply rate doing those things. They're a little bit more money. They're more money but uh, they're so tailored and so customized. People really, really, really appreciate them. Get huge response rates. Now that response can be I'm not interested and go away, or why'd you send me you know, a sweatshirt with my alma mater on it? But people will respond to you. And at the end of the day, that's the hardest part of our jobs is getting someone just to listen to us. So those are an awesome way to do that. So you've built a list. You're making sure you're in your territory in the right times. You've now gained access. So this gets to kind of the heart of what I'm talking about. Uh, and there's, and I apologize for the uh, eyesore diagram, and you're going to have about four more of those, so you know, <laughs> sorry again and again and again. Um, but this is a sales process that I follow called uh, MedPick. It's an adaptation on a very well-known sales process called Medic. Has anyone in the room ever used Medic? A couple people. Anyone ever heard MedPick? A couple people. Okay. The only difference between the two, paper process. Paper process is super important to make sure that your commits stay. Anyone here ever missed a commit? Everyone's hands better go up. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I miss commits like on a regular basis still. So, and if people don't know what a commit is, it's when you tell a business you're going to close something, it doesn't close on time. OK. Has that ever happened? OK. Hopefully more people raise their hands. All right, good. So the, uh, I'm going to get into each of these things and what they are and what they mean. Uh, the M stands for metrics. The E is your economic buyer, as we've talked about, decision maker. Uh, decision process, decision criteria, then the paper process, then what's the pain? Have you built coaches? Have you built competitors? Why I'm showing it to you like this, this is actually a direct slide out of uh, closed plans that I use. So every single deal that I work on, once it gets past probably the analysis phase, it's a real opportunity, I build a little slide deck that has all of these things in them and how they relate to that individual opportunity that I'm working on. And I'll color code them, red, yellow, green. Red, I don't have this information. It is a gap in my deal. I need to solve it. Yellow, I think I'm OK. I have some of the information. But has it been verified by the buyer? Is it 100% sure that I'm confident that this is fact? And at that point, then it's, it goes to green. So let's talk about each of these. I'm going to, in future slides, talk about where in the sales process they apply. I just want to create some definitions for you and give you guys some real examples. So metrics. How many people build business cases on their deals? A couple. OK. The fastest deals I've ever closed, the most profitable deals I've ever closed, I have rock solid business cases on. I'll give you guys an example. Um, I was meeting with the chief people officer of a pretty well-known company. You guys all have heard of Caliber Collision? OK. car there two weeks ago. Yes. You do a great job, by the way. Huge fan of Caliber Collision, if you guys are listening. Um, <laughs> so uh, they uh, fix cars. And one of the main people that fix cars are body technicians. If they do not have a body tech, they can't fix a car. And what that means is they just simply have to have that car sit on the lot for longer periods of time. And customers then get frustrated and all that. So I was meeting with Caliber Collision. And one of the first meetings I had with them, I asked them, what are your main issues? What are you trying to solve for? And they said, well, we need more body techs. And I said, OK, so what? Well, body techs are how we fix cars. OK, so what? 
well, it's how we generate revenue and keep our clients happy. Okay, so what? And they keep going on, looking at me like I had two heads. I'm like, what are the revenue implications of, that bi of you not having a body tech? They paused for a second. They thought. They said, $50,000 a month. For every body tech they don't have, and by the way, they didn't have hundreds of them, they were losing $50,000 a month. So I built a business case with them on the spot that had them generating a million dollars a month in net new revenue just as a pilot for one region on my solution. Believe it or not, that deal still took three months to close. Um, it probably would have taken a year otherwise. But building a business case, understanding, and business cases are not necessarily pain. Pain is the high level issue. The business case is the economic cause and the uh, if they don't solve this problem, what it's going to mean. So it's the opportunity loss. So it's, it's fixing it and the revenue that they gain. And if they don't fix it, the revenue that they're going to lose. Uh, metrics to me are, are super important. They can also be things like uh, we, there's some marketing folks in the room. So what does it mean to have a click-through rate increase? What is your click-through rate today? Where do you want it to be? What are the revenue implications of that change? So metrics are the kind of the, the, the pieces of the business case and or the improvements that are actually going to be had by someone making a change to your solution. Uh, the next is the economic buyer. Uh, I think we've defined that. I think most folks know what that is. Do they have discretionary funds? Can they make a decision? Uh, the next piece is your decision process. So we're going we're gonna to get into you know, how you uncover all that and, and when you do that. But if you think about each of these stages, these are stages within a deal that if they're in red today, because they don't need to be necessarily done at the front end. You could do these on active deals that you have today. Do you really understand the decision process that your client's going through? There are a lot of sales meetings that I walk out of where people are like, we had a great meeting, they love me. They want to do business with me. They're so happy, they're my best friend. Well, when are they trying to make a decision? I don't know. But they want to buy my solution. Well, who's involved? Well, I, I talked to this person. They're, they're probably going to buy from me. So do you really understand, have you really dove into all the criteria of their actual process. Next is the criteria that they'll judge you by. Think of this as a wish list. Do you truly understand your client's wish list and how well your solution aligns to that wish list? Uh, we talked about paper process a little bit. Uh, paper process to me is how you stop deals from slipping, how you make sure your deals hit their commits. This is typically done during the alignment phase towards the end of the sales process. But your paper process is super, super important because I can't tell you how many times I've told a business they're going to buy from me today and they don't buy from me for six months to a year. And how does that make us all kind of look as salespeople? Uh, it makes us look like we don't know our business. So if you really want to know your business, who's involved in the paper process? Who's actually signing it? How long does it take them to sign that deal in the past? Uh, do they have competing priorities? Are they on vacation? Things like that. Uh, especially important as we get towards the end of a, a month, a quarter, or a year. Uh, so identify pain. How well have you actually identified the true pain that your client is, is focused on? Uh, and then have you built coaches and competitors? Uh, so coaches, I think we all know. Uh, I define a coach as someone that will give you inside information on an opportunity. Coaches are typically built after you've pitched them a solution because they're the ones that are smiling, that are coming to you saying, I want this, and then there's other people arguing with you then why they come, you shouldn't buy it or, or what have you. The coaches are the ones that will give you inside information. Leverage your coaches. If you ask them tough questions and they're not willing to give you real answers, they're not a coach, you can't rely on them. Coaches are ones that are willing to give you real inside information. Uh, and then know who your competitors. Um, if I asked anyone in the room, do they know what landmines are? Do you guys all know what landmines are? Okay. So... We, uh, with, and I'll talk about this as well, but knowing your competitors allows you to set landmines. If you don't know who's in that deal and you don't know how you differentiate from them, that is a gap in a sales process that can really, really, really hurt you. Um, I, I haven't mentioned this, but I sell uh, recruiting solutions, um, outsourced solutions. Uh, one of the differentiators of my product versus others is that we offer people dedicated teams. They get our, it's almost like a white-labeled recruiting department that we offer. Um, my competitors do a lot of shared service. So in every single one of my opportunities, I'm asking, and I'm talking to folks and saying, uh, have you talked to my competitor? Do you know how the model that they're going to create for you? And do you know or see the value in a dedicated model versus a shared service model? And when they leave that meeting with me and go talk to my competitors, and then they come back to me and say, well, we want dedicated shared services and going to work as well, that's a landmine that I just set that, regardless of price, will lead people back to me. So think about 
the landmines that you have versus your competitors, make sure you know them. And then, all right, how can I set those during my pitch and during my sales process? And this is, guys, we're, we never badmouth competitors. Um, they're in business for a reason. They probably do things right. It's knowing what they are and knowing your strengths versus them and how to position it to make sure that people understand objectively what they're getting themselves into to make the right business decision. So let's talk about the actual uh, stages of a deal. Uh, FTV, it's an old Aramark term, stands for first time visit. Uh, at the FTV stage, I see a CentOS guy. Do you guys use that too? We, it's a little different, but very similar. Very similar, okay. So uh, FTV stands for first time visit. The goal of a first time meeting, call, say it's 30 minutes long, 15 minutes, half that meeting, you want to be spending getting them to talk about the challenges that they're having. What issues are they faced with? What are they trying to achieve? Then the next 15 minutes of that meeting is all about how your solution can potentially align to theirs and what that kind of big idea that you have for them is. Now, I'm going to be talking about deal stages here and MedPick and how they relate. Just know that, again, I'm selling enterprise solutions on, on a really large scale. Uh, you can consolidate these. So for me, my average sales cycle is a year, uh, can be longer. And I probably have to have 30 meetings uh, or conversations with various buyers within an organization. On average, I have four or five buyers plus end users. Um, it's just a, it's a matrix sale. Uh, so where more transactional or different types of sales cycles, you could probably have in one to two meetings, three to four meetings, things like that. So think of these through the lens of how do I adapt these principles to my process, not necessarily saying that, again, what I'm doing is 100% is right and total fit for you. So first time meeting, 30 minutes long, alignment, and what it's always setting up for, and this is the piece that I think is really important that uh, you guys should be taking away, is the purpose of a first meeting is to create enough alignment that someone's willing to go through an analysis phase. It's not to pitch. If you pitch before you understand all the things I just talked about, the business case for change, their paper pro or sorry, their uh, decision criteria, decision process, who all's involved, what their real pain is. If you pitch before you know those things, you've essentially, think of a game of poker, you just threw your cards on the table and said, I, I have this, and they are still holding all of their cards. Um, it's going to make it really hard for you to win or bluff or do anything like that. So the analysis phase to me, this is where deals are won or lost. A lot of people believe that where you win a deal is in the pitch. It's only partially true. You win a deal in a pitch when you've done a, a really, really strong analysis and tied the pitch to all of their key issues, all of the critical issues. So that's why analysis phase is so important. And again, you can do an analysis on a first time visit. It's not that you have to slow down your sales process, you have to change things. For me, large enterprise sales, I can't go into a meeting with a chief executive, CHRO, CFO, and say, I need three hours of your time. I, I will get laughed at and kicked out immediately. So that's why my meetings start at 30 minutes, and then we set this up. My analysis phase is almost always longer than my pitch. The purpose of the analysis is you go really, really, really deep on all of the issues. When I talked about MedPick a second ago, by the time you leave your analysis phase, the vast majority of your med pick should be in green. Some of it may be still in yellow. Decision process, um, I'm sorry, paper process will likely still be in yellow. Uh, who your real coaches are will probably still be in red or yellow because they haven't actually seen your product yet. You've just spent a lot of time asking them questions. Uh, so they, they may or may not like you at that point. Um, the analysis phase is super critical. Uh, this is where you're understanding all those individual things. And that is where you get to your demo. So the demo phase, how I always start my demos is with um, a clear example of the market conditions that are driving the issue. So it's, uh, again, recruiting, 3.9% uh, unemployment. We're in a full employment economy. Uh, people are not actively applying for jobs. If you want a job, you have a job. So it's talking about the market conditions that uh, lead to my solution. So I always start there. Then from there, it's a direct alignment of the analysis. So you told me that you're losing, as I mentioned, $50,000 for every body tech you don't have. You're losing a million dollars of revenue I can help you gain per month. Let's talk about how I'm going to help you solve that problem. 
and then it's going really deep into here's exactly the model we built, here's exactly how it's going to help you solve that challenge, here's exactly the ROI time frame that you're going to have. It's, it's very, very, very tailored. If you guys are pitching and you're pitching and it's, if, if your pitch sounds the same every single time, take a hard look at yourself because it shouldn't. Your pitch should change every single meeting. Now, high-level things you touch on, yeah, th those will be the same. I talk about the, um, the same type of model every single time. But it's, it's specifically aligned to the business objectives. Another thing I'd highly recommend, we talked about economic buyers, and this can be a, a little bit uncomfortable for folks the first time they do it. But has anybody ever showed up to a meeting and you confirmed the meeting and you were ready to rock and roll and the person that was supposed to be in the meeting that you know would make a decision sent somebody else to be in that meeting? Most people, and I'm guilty of this, would pitch that person. I would challenge you to think about if you close that deal. I can tell you when I've done that, I've lost more than I've won. So again, this can be uncomfortable, but if you fly across the country or you take your time, you're a human, they're a human, and they've said they'd meet with you and they send somebody else, you respectfully say, hey, I'm willing to wait 15 minutes for that person. I'm here. I'd love to meet with them. If they really can't meet, let's reschedule. Don't pitch someone different than the person you know needs to hear your solution. Don't ever trust, don't ever trust someone else to sell your product. You will never be able to educate them as well as you're educated. And that can be uncomfortable. First few times you do it, it'll be uncomfortable. What you'll end up seeing happens is, You'll wait for those 15 minutes, and all of a sudden, that person that you were supposed to meet with will show up. Or they will profusely apologize and agree to meet with you whenever you want. So when I'm at the demo phase, those are some things that I'm doing. Those are how I'm approaching it. Uh, and those are you know, what I'm making sure I'm holding my clients accountable that they're there with me. So then we're getting to alignment. Uh, alignment, it, to me, is worth things really get real. This is the part where you've done the analysis. You know the business case. You know everything about this client. You know exactly how you're going to solve them. You know the pain. You, you, you are rock solid on your solution. You've pitched them your way of solving it. This is the conversation. And again, this can happen right after the pitch. This doesn't need to be another meeting. For me, it typically is. Um, where you're having a conversation with them and you're saying, do we agree on all of these things? Do we agree that my solution can get you the outcomes I'm saying it can? I have not presented a contract. I have not asked them to buy from me yet. I've simply made sure that everything I think is going to happen, they also think is going to happen. If you start pitching or if you start presenting contracts at this phase and you have not done a tight alignment, this is when you're going to start getting a lot of pushback, a lot of arguing, a lot of posturing, or I need to bring other people in, into the room and all these things. The alignment phase is, is where it's, it's the biggest validation step. Do not present a contract to someone until you are completely aligned on the outcome of your solution. This is when you're also discussing uh, what I consider business terms. So, okay, we've all agreed, right solution, right business case, I can do what you're saying. This is what it's going to cost you. Do you have budget for it? Who else needs to be involved? Does, it just, does my business case justify that? Can I start drafting a contract for you? Please do yourselves a favor. Do not negotiate in the alignment phase. In fact, don't negotiate at all until you are in contract with somebody. And what I mean by that is you've presented them a contract and their legal team has reviewed it and cut back to you with feedback. Now, on smaller deals, maybe it's not their legal team. Maybe they have outside counsel. Maybe it, it's the president of a company. But you need to hold your, your price and your cards really close to your vest. The reason why I say that, you will always get pricing pressure on a deal. You cannot close a deal until there's some tension. Okay? The more you give away at the alignment phase, that's the new starting point for negotiation when you get into contracting. Has anyone ever been a deal with this where you've said, I will, you know, typical deal is three years long, but we'll do two this time? And then you get to contracting and procurement says, well, we only do 18 month contracts. Well, if you started at three and you stayed at three, maybe they do a two year contract. 
So this is where you can really start to lose some of your commissions, and you want to be really, really careful uh, what you give away before you get to contracting. So now once you're in contracting, how you know you're in contracting? You're no longer dealing with, in theory, the economic buyer. They'll sign the contract, but there's someone else that's, that's negotiating terms with you. Don't negotiate terms with your economic buyer. You can if it's you know, one man shop or you know, a small company or a president that makes decisions. But as you get you know, into bigger and bigger organizations, they have procurement departments, they have legal departments, they have inside or outside counsel. Make sure you're actually having conversations with those people because those are the people that are trained to beat you up. And whatever you told anyone else during the entire sales process, that's the starting point that those people are going to fall from. So be really, really careful there. Um, another big thing is anyone here ever use the term or know the term give to get? Okay. Does everyone follow give to get? Okay. Do you guys have predetermined um, uh, non what I call non monetary trade ups? Things that you know you can give away, like uh, free implementation, that honestly don't mean a lot, but mean a lot to them? Yeah. Okay. Bargaining chips? Okay. So don't negotiate till you're in this step. Make sure you're give to get. Uh, this to me is really important. If someone wants a, if my deal is three years and they want a two year deal, well, your price needs to go up. Or you need, or you need to, I don't know, do a video reference for me. You need to do something for me to, for me to decrease potentially my commissions, because that impacts me personally and professionally, and hurts my business. So you need to be doing something there. Be willing to walk away and know what that means. And I'll give you guys a really good example. I was working on a $600,000 deal, a three-year deal worth $1.8 million. I worked on it for a year. It gets to procurement. Procurement says to me, we only sign one-year deals. So I had known the paper process. I had essentially made sure that expectation was set for an entire year with everyone that was involved in the decision. But it got to procurement, we only signed one-year deals. Well, we've been talking a three-year deal the whole time. The pricing is based on this. The business case is based on this. Everything we're doing is based on three years. We decreased that. Here's the business case. Make sure you're always going back to the business case anytime someone asks you for anything. It's like, well, if we make this change, here's how it changes the business case, because it will. You increase your price, you're gonna, people are going to get less of a net ROI from your solution, because they're going to have to pay more for your solution. Um, so anything impacts that. So bring that back often. In this deal, we told them, look, uh, we can't even justify the cost or standing up a model for you in one year. We'll lose money, and we would have. So we, and this was painful, guys. I mean, I spent a year on this deal. It was worth $1.8 million to the business, 600000 a year to me. Uh, we told them, we don't think this is going to work, and we're sorry. And we started walking away. And you know what they did? They pulled us right back in. Sorry, guys. I completely understand your position. What about a two-year deal? <coughs> OK. Well, now we're up from one. We're at, we're at two. That's awesome. So yeah, we can do a two-year deal. But I want you to be a reference for me. And you're actually going to have to pay more. And we got them to a point where they got their two-year deal, their reference, and they're paying us more money. So know your walk-away conditions. Don't be afraid to walk away. In fact, I would say if you're not walking away, you're leaving money on the table for yourselves, and you should probably walk away more often. It's a really unnerving, uncomfortable feeling the first few times you do it. It starts to become a game, and it starts to be a lot of fun. Um, <laughs> it really does. Uh, so know when to walk away. Uh, and that's, uh, that's it for me. Uh, I've got about 11 minutes left in time. I'd uh, love to take any questions from you guys. Um, so as it relates to, uh, I think you outlined the process beautifully. Um, when you're, when you're not selling something that is as customized, I guess, multi-year, everything you do is probably different for one client than it mm -hmm. would be for another, as far as the actual solution, including the ability to bring in a dedicated, dedicated team. Yeah. When you're selling something that's I consider what I sell not to be transactional, but significantly sure. more transactional than what you sell. Sure, fair. And getting to the point where you're talking about pricing later in the discussion is not something that a lot of my clients 
want to they at least want to know a ballpark estimation of what they're going to pay how would you handle that discussion for what you do specifically i'm not asking you to put yourself in my shoes but how do you handle that when you cut when a client says roughly what is this going to cost me in in one of the earlier discussions before you have the opportunity to 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 outline value does that make sense it's a great question um I'll often pivot. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, Sorry. No, no. Make you walk. So I'll often pivot back to the business case aspect of it. Um, I'll want to know, okay, so you're telling me cost is important. Help me understand uh, why is it important. So, and everyone knows cost is important, but what is, what are you trying to get? What are, what are you trying to solve for? And what's the real pain and what are the real implications of solving that pain? And I'll say, look, you know, it's typically not part of my process just to tell you what things cost right out of the gate. But if you'll do me a favor, uh, you know, out of curiosity, what are you paying today? And what do you budget for? And if I could uh, use an arbitrary thing, like uh, what do you sell? I'm sorry. I sell software, mostly perpetual software licenses. For and, and what kind of software? What does it do? Engineering simulation software. So, like, simulation. think okay. of CAD, but better than CAD, like, you know, being okay. able to simulate the performance of a product and make it better earlier. Cut. Okay. So Significant value there. Yeah. So, but, not, not having your solution of, what, um, failure rates are increasing. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. Number of prototypes being created. Okay. Going up. Significant cost associated with that. So, so. I would kind of, I, I would get to me the business case there. What's your current failure rate? You know, what prototypes aren't getting through and why. Right. Um, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd make sure I was focused on what you were there to solve for and what the challenge was. Right. Get to a point where it's no longer about cost. If you build the right business case, cost is a factor in a business case. Right. But if your failure rate is, I don't know, I'm using arbitrary numbers, 20% today, and I get it down to 10%, and in order to build that widget, you need to spend this much money, and if I can help you save that much money and your failure rate goes down to this, right. I made you this, my solution costs this, net ROI is that. Right. So it's it's having that conversation and being willing to, and we all have listened and read Challenger, it's, it's being willing to right. push back a little bit right. and say, hold on, before we get to cost, let's, let's talk about what we're really trying to do here. Right. Cool. I don't Thanks. know if that adds value, but no, that's... Yes, definitely. Okay. Thank you. So you mentioned your eight point, eight touch point, yeah, persistence, persistence, model, right? Yeah. What is the a two part question? What is your time frame for that? Eight and weeks. How, so it's once a week. Once a week. Have you noticed a difference? How did you? Well, then this is the second part of my yeah. question. How did you settle on eight weeks? Mm-hmm. Was it ineffective at four and equally ineffective at twelve? What kind of cadences had you played with prior to settling with eight weeks? I wanted to touch people as many times as I could as fast as I could mm-hmm. and I also then thought about myself and if someone sends me something more than once a week I just I get mad um, so I, I kind of felt like that was it was gut felt like that was the right cadence okay um, and what I'll do to, to make this really simple is um, I'll uh, write out like a word document mm-hmm. um, week one here's my thing you know week two here's the next thing so when I get into uh, my work week that week, it's already there. I've already thought through it. I've already wrote it. I already know exactly where it's going to be. So it's a like copy, paste, send, 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 send. Execute it. So your yeah. pre-call planning is eight pre-calls, yeah. essentially, and then it's ready to go. Yeah. And Okay. And then the last thing I want to ask just really quickly. So when you go through MedPick and you've got your color coding, your stoplight, to, do you have a scorecard that you keep for yourself? Do you use an Excel spreadsheet? Do you have a plug-in in Salesforce or something to do this? Like, how do you? It's manual, unfortunately. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I'm doing MedPick on uh, specific opportunities. Mm-hmm. So if, if I'm getting, and it's after the analysis, right around the pitch, once, I've, once I feel like I have a deal, if mm-hmm. I have a really good first time visit and there's some really tight alignment there, I'll start building my uh, MedPick, it's, it's a deck. And the deck is you know uh, slide one metrics. And what are the metrics for this organization? You know, slide two, economic buyer. Uh, do I know who they are? Do I know who else is involved? Or am I sure that's the person? And I'm, I'm color coding it. And I'm actually listing their exact metrics, their exact name. Like each, I, I, I essentially type out all my notes and align them to these steps within the PowerPoint. And I, I call that my close plan. Mm-hmm. And what I'm doing is I'm constantly referencing that before my meeting, before my follow-up. 
you know, I'm looking at that and I'm saying, do I have these things in the green, yellow, or red? And if they're in any, any of those stages, the purpose of my next meeting is to get them out, you know, progressed. That's so good. Thank you. Yep. Thanks so much, David. That was awesome. Um, seems like you do a lot of testing. You've got metrics. You're doing all kinds of cadence. Like, and this is kind of a question for all the speakers that I kind of think about is how, how do you determine when to change up a strategy or an approach or, or metrics? Like, are you looking at success rates? Are you looking at failure rates? Uh, you, you know, cause there is, there's the, Hey, you know, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Things yep. are going well versus, you know, I need to try, I need to refresh this. I mean, kind of where's the line? How do you think about that? Yeah, no, that's, that's a great question. And it, it's kind of constantly needs to be measured. And, mm. you know, my eight touch campaigns, when I first got into territory, every time I ran one of those, I'd schedule 15 to 20 meetings with executives. I've uh, been in territory now for almost four years. The last time I ran it, I only scheduled three to four meetings. Uh, it was a, a painful, eye-opening thing to say, you know, my first couple years within territory were my best years, uh, as I was talking about. And now uh, it, it's not as successful. So I need to now almost up my game. And that's where a lot of these uh, college drops that I was talking about have mm -hmm. came into play. So I'm getting, I'm still doing some of the eight touch on certain ones, but instead of kind of this uh, casting a wide net, like with the eight touch, I was hitting 100 people um, eight times. So 800 outreaches in an eight week period. Um, that's why I create campaigns and that's why I script them and that's why it's you know, methodical. Um, I hit so many people over you know two, three, four years that it got to a point where I said, all right, I now need to, instead of being casting such a wide net because I've already done that for so long, mm -hmm. I now need to be highly targeted. So what accounts are I really, what are, what are the 10 accounts? Because you can't send hoodies to everybody. Um, I don't have unlimited budget, I wish I did. Um, so what are the 10 accounts that I really think uh, that will lead me the most revenue? What are the 10 accounts that I feel like are best aligned for our solution that we can have the best business impact for the client? And all right, let me send you know, very, very tailored, you know, co more costly, but highly tailored things to them. So it's, it's kind of once I see, start seeing those diminishing returns, it's, you, you, know, you gotta change it up, see what's next. Awesome. David, awesome uh, presentation. Wanted to quickly ask you, I love the idea of the trinkets that you gave away. What other really creative uh, ideas did you have to kind of get that first customer meeting? So we've done a lot of different things. Um, Yetis, not, not college-based Yetis, just Yetis. Everybody, everybody know what a Yeti is? Everyone know a Yeti? People freaking love Yetis. Um, pardon my French. Um, so... Uh, Yetis have been phenomenal. They get great results, uh, especially in Texas during the summer. It's like a godsend. The Yetis are amazing. Um, so Yetis have been great. Um, college drops have been great that I mentioned. Uh, gift cards. Uh, and and it, it doesn't need to be a lot of money. I've done things like, I'd like to buy you a cup of coffee. Here's the Starbucks gift card in advance. Stuff like that. Do, do you have any here? Do one need some? I know. <laughs> I think Tom needs a few too. What's your call to action when you send that out? Uh, call to action can be, uh, it's often in star format. So here's the challenge that I'm seeing you have. Uh, here's the uh, situation, or here's the action that clients of mine have taken. Here's the results that they've gotten. I, I do a lot within that star format. Um, I'd love to meet with you to discuss, you know, do you have 30 minutes this day, this time, very specific. I'll often include a case study with, with those things as well. So someone can, it's not just me saying we've had results. Here's an exact example of what we've done for a similar client. Thank you guys. I appreciate it.